Okay. Uh, Councilman Clifford Ross. Um, I have Councilman Montague with us at the present moment. And um, we're here. This is a seminar today on a shooter attack. What would you do if a shooter was in your presence? What would you do if a shooter was in this building right now? In your doctor's office, at a restaurant, at a bar? What would you do? Would you run? Would you hide? What would you fight? What would you do? Hide by the cheap name. That's the answer. You know, run, hide, hide and fight. fight. Run, hide, and fight. You know, that's a quick decision that we all have to make when something happens. Sometimes it's not good to run. Sometimes it's not good to hide. Sometimes it's not good to fight. But uh, we have our chief and his department here that's gonna go through, you know, when it's a good time to do that and, and when we should do it. And also he's gonna talk about our schools, you know, what we should be doing and how we can plan for a shooter attack in our school system. And, and again, I, I went to a seminar like this once before and it was very, very informative, okay? Because you need to know. I mean, it happened to all of us. So, you know, sit back, relax. We're gonna see some videos. And um, our staff right here with the Chief Vinny is gonna show us what to do and when to do it. Councilman? Well, he, he summed it all up. Councilman Ross, um, Councilman Ross and Montague, I just wanna let you know this is a very, very important seminar. You never know what's gonna happen in life day to day, we don't know. You'd be in church, the supermarket, we have, we have all heard of events like that in the supermarket, in church, even in places we all doing the right thing, but you never know what's going to happen. So I want everybody to listen, learn, and, and just, just be careful. Because you never know what's going to happen on a day-to-day basis. I want to thank Chief Penny. I see Councilman Coley coming in here. Um, this is very important. So everybody take heed and enjoy the seminar. Thank you. And, and just one more thing. This information that you're going to receive today could possibly save your life. So pay attention, and I'm going to turn it over to Chief Benny Video. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Again, I just want to thank Cal Councilman Ross, Councilman Montague. I want to recognize Councilman Kerry Coley for bringing this to our attention, to putting this together, to let you know how to protect yourselves and how we're going to also protect you. Because that's our job to protect you, but we also need you guys to be trained and to know what you could do, which should ultimately help us if something like this happens, if something unfortunately happens. So I just want to introduce to my, I, I got the best staff ever, I got to tell you, out of any police department. <laughs> I got he got he, he now commands the SWAT team. Captain Brian Mooney, Special Operations Commander. He was a teammate with me on the SWAT team. Mike Kingoli, where I came in for how many years? The SWAT team also came up together. Detective Lieutenant Jeff Greg Johnson, Special Operations. This is my lifesaver here. Floor's dropping. This man is certified so many different active shooter, emergency management, incident command. He's invaluable to the police department. And I also have to bring up Mike Pandis, works directly at my office, and Kelly, my confidential assistant. Sometimes she's not so confidential, but you don't want to get into that. So we're going to start out. I'll just give you a little brief history of me. 34 years I've been in here, came up to every rank from a patrolman, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, Cleo, commanding officer, and now chief, ultimately chief. But in that time, I was a SWAT operator when we first started the SWAT team. I was a SWAT leader and ultimately a commander. I had to step down from being a commander when I became the captain, and I, I was in charge of internal affairs because there was conflict. And with that being said, I turned it over to Pete Cassidy. Our team is probably one of the best trained teams 
in this, in this state. And fact, Kerry observed it when we had some incidents here. I guess some unfortunate incidents where we lost police officers and the team had to be assembled. And we were the ones going for 90 days looking for, for the suspects. So training is very important to us. Like I, I tell people all the time, Pete wants all the shiny new toys, which is a good thing. Shiny new toys are good. However, the best thing to have is a trained operator. You're going to have an operator train, and you're going to give them a mid grade toy way better than a person that's semi trained for a shiny new toy. So, our guys train, 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 train. So, I'm confident each and every one of Our patrolmen, from the ones who start the academy to the ones that are kept, they're all trained in active shooter. We're trained to protect our citizens. We're trained in de-escalation. Uh, we take our job seriously here. And I got to tell you, uh, I was never more proud. I'm always proud of these guys. Well, we had a, does anybody remember that Swanee incident at the high school with the active shooter? Who was our response time? It was three minutes. We're three minutes. Three minutes from getting the call, finding out what was going on, to being in the school. Clearing that school out. Clearing that school out. <laughs> what happened in Texas and what happened anywhere, and I guarantee you this, I'll guarantee my life on this, will never happen here. Our guys will be in and we'll go in, and our main focus is to neutralize the threat and save our citizens, especially when we don't mess with the kids. Don't, don't mess with anybody. Kids. So, what else? Anybody have, have a question before we start? I like questions. <laughs> but you're in good hands. These guys will show you. Oh, wait. Angela, you can stand up. You got to recognize Captain Angela Cummings. She's our Community Service Bureau. She does a wonderful job. So, if you want to start, start a block watch or any community issues, you can Captain Angela. But uh, yeah, you're in good hands. These guys are all trained for the mask. Now we want to present our knowledge to you. We want to make sure you guys know what you're doing and you're safe. So you can protect yourselves until we get there. So with that being said. Right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, I spoke to Councilman Ross uh, approximately a month ago and we uh, set this up. Uh, and it was kind of conflicting because I, I said, you know, Councilman, we have to do a lot of uh, work around this because we train, 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 and we train some more. And uh, I gave them the dates that wouldn't be available because we do train. So uh, my name is Lieutenant Pete Cassidy. Uh, I've been with the Orange Police Department. Uh, I'm in my 24th year here now. And I have uh, just over 25 years uh, in law enforcement and public safety. Uh, back in December of 2019, uh, everybody remembers that horrific incident where the Jersey City police officer was murdered uh, in a cemetery in Jersey City. Our team assembled and was in Jersey City on the ground ready to operate within, within le in less than an hour to get from Orange to Jersey City. Uh, we had about a 10-man ten, ten uh, team that ended up going down there and we're just there to uh, render support for Jersey City police and those agencies. Since then, we've taken that team and we've taken the team and we built it to, uh, we re completely reorganized and restructured. And we have now about 23 uh, officers, uh, three lieutenants, uh, three sergeants, and a bunch of officers. It's a part time team. Everybody comes from all different disciplines from the police department. So we have patrol officers, we have detectives uh, from every different division within the police department. And we go, we work on an all, uh, on call basis, and we're ready to respond. With that, we also train our uh, patrol officers as well as to this. What you're going to see here, it's a universal training. So, what everything we do, it, it's a national standard. The run, hide, fight. Well, it's not always one hide, fight. It can be fight, run, hide. I mean, it, it's it, it can go in any different order because depending on where you are in a situation. And let me tell you, it can happen, and it will happen. We're just very fortunate that it hasn't really happened that much in this area. And 
I can tell you this, no matter where you are in this area, New Jersey, you probably have some of the best trained and uh, highly uh, disciplined officers in this area that will come out. And you may not be, you know, our backup group here, we may be joined up with South Orange, West Orange, East Orange, North Burlington, and everybody else that's going to come. That's, that's the positive side. We have so many officers, and we're so close together here, and we all train and operate the same way. So no matter what, everybody's really trained to, to the highest level. Uh, the chief said earlier, Uvalde, what you saw there was a travesty. We would never see that here in New Jersey. Just really, and he would be done a lot, lot differently. Um, so with that said, um, our team is ready, and we can operate. In, uh, and we, we are utilized throughout the county by prosecutors as well. We work in conjunction with the Sheriff's Department's tactical teams, the North Police Department tactical teams, and we're part of a tactical task force uh, through the urban area uh, security initiative as well. That's how we end up with these other places. So uh, we train uh, at least twice a month, usually more. Uh, we use uh, the military facilities up at the Big Kenny Arsenal. They have a training facility up there that's free of charge for us, and that's the best thing ever because a lot of this comes out no cost to their taxpayers. This uh, a lot of the training we got. We also do a two-week mandatory training, two weeks uh, every year, where we just dedicate two weeks to complete training and operational exercises that we do. Uh, unfortunately, some of the stuff that we do we can't show the public because obviously they are already. Uh, trade secret in, in, in that essence that we don't want people to see what we do and how we do things. Every time we go out, we operate, we are all, you know, we are wearing uh, helmets, tactical vests, we are equipped with uh, long rifles, uh, tactical handguns, and everybody has to speak and uh, qualify uh, at minimum four times a year, but we are obviously doing more. So the, the team itself is just completely, it, it's been reorganized and refocused to, to the community and to support not just our community, but any community that may need our assistance at any time. So without uh, further ado, I guess. Uh, let, let everybody say it looks like yeah. themselves. Uh, Captain, Captain Brian Mooney. Captain Brian Mooney, I'm the Captain of the Special Operations Division. Uh, obviously, a couple of things. One, my division uses the uh, entry teams now. Um, one of the things that the Lieutenant was saying also, we, everyone's equipped with a body more camera on these entries as well. Um, we use them. We found it uh, tactically safe. It's safe for the officers going in. It's safe for the, the, the places where we're going into, high-risk scenarios. Um, and I grew up as an operator as well. One of the things that we all can all attest to, everyone in the room, uh, is either somebody's mother, brother, sister, father. I have children in school systems and things like that. So all this stuff is relative to me. I take it personally to look into it, to, to train myself as well as I can, to understand it because it could be any time I'm dropping my kid off to school, this could happen or anything like that, um, and vice versa, it can happen any time here. And I'm proud to say uh, that the response team, the tactical, uh, the usage of our uh, SWAT team it has been uh, fantastic, and that, that response to the school uh, that day, uh, you know, again, that was as big a scenario as you could have, and it's good to see it live. Uh, I hate to say it ever happens, but at least we were able to see it and put it into operation and know that it's there. So um, what the presentation put together, I uh, hope it answers a lot of questions. Like I said, my personal experience knowing this stuff it has more to do with just being a police officer and an operator, has a lot to do with you know what I take home at night as well. So thank you, and uh, any questions at the end, I can play Any questions, any question you have, just straight your hand. My question. I'd be remiss I forgot to mention Robert Cherry back here. <laughs> How can I get Cherry? Also, community service. I've known Cherry almost 40 years. Born on my side most of the time, but a great guy. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I'm Captain Cummins, Orange Police Community Service Commander. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm here in an informal capacity. I just wanted to come out because in my entire career, I haven't witnessed this. So this information is very important. It's valuable. And once you have the information, God forbid you find yourself in this type of an incident, you'll know how to act. So preparedness is essential. So um, take notes, get the information, and utilize it. And pass it on. Okay? 
Good evening, Lieutenant Michael Tingoli and Lieutenant Rick Patrol. Uh, I've been in this department my entire career. It started January 2001. I came and operated with the, uh, under the privilege of the chief. We uh, first started in 03. I'm still a member. I still get out, I still run. I still do the exercises with the whole side of the first month. I don't continue. Uh, I enjoy it. I love it. Eight years prior military as well. Had any questions? I'm willing to answer out in the hallway. Good evening, everyone. I'm Detective Lieutenant Johnson. Uh, been here about 20 years. I'm Lieutenant in Narcotics, uh, Special Operations, one of the captain of uh, me. Uh, also in training, and just everything they said. Just to reiterate, uh, Chief Vidiello along with everyone here, they're giving us all the tools to be part of the training division just to try to equip our officers more with being able to view situations and do the best that we can to get the job done efficiently, safely. Good point, I missed on what uh, Greg said, is that we can't do this without the support of the mayor, council people, city government, everybody, community. Because we have been given what we need to do our job, whether it be equipment and technology. And we just keep advancing and advancing. And you guys have been here a long time. Have we noticed a change in arms? Right? That's because we're all in it together. We just don't do it as a police department. We do it as a team. We do it with the administration, the mayor, the council, the fire department, the citizens. The citizens, you guys are our biggest asset because you give us the information we need when we need it to carry out our job. And so we truly appreciate it. Boris, tell a little bit about yourself. He's a little apprehensive because... <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Boris Joplik. I'm a police officer with our police department. I've been on with the department for about five years. Started off with uh, fortunate enough, lucky to get picked up by the Orange. There's 10 of, ten of us in, the, in my class. Uh, I went to a bunch of training during my tenure, even before becoming a police officer, it varies just throughout the country, even in the state. As you can see, it's military fatigue, homeland security, the list goes on. Um, when I actually took this training, um, the one thing that I wanted to is when I take it back, where do you think I took this back first? And this is going to be class participation in this case. Would anybody know where did I take this first when I learned the uh, information? To the, the no. to the department? I took it home. Okay. I made sure that my parents, my brother, and everybody else knew how to act on these things. Because like the command staff said, sometimes you don't have this type of material. Sometimes they can't go to see this. So you want to make sure you bring it to the family first to know how they act. So surviving the active threat component, this deals with bystanders and anybody that incident does happen in front of it. Boris, can I take a right here? Tell him why. This this kid has such a unique story to tell, and he's very humble, so he won't tell it. Mm -hmm. Tell him where you're from and why you're here. All right, I'm originally from Bosnia, so I'm a refugee. I came here in 99 from the war that happened in Europe. I was fortunate enough to be kind of in the stationary area. I went to college to Rutgers, and I also went down to D.C. as well. I came back, and I was trying to get a job as a cop. Uh, short and simple, <laughs> Not a, straight to the point. But the topic of the thing you're going to focus on mostly is the run, hide, fight. And as the lieutenant mentioned earlier, they're not going to be in order. They could happen however dictates what's in front of you. So if the, if the individual with the gun is in front of you, you might have to end up fighting. So to get the gears rolling, when the incident happens like this, do you have a contact that you could call right away that you could pick up and say, hey, listen, this is what's going on. You can tell them what, where you are, what the need is. That's number one. You always want to make sure you call somebody so you tell them what is going on. With that being said, our learning objective is going to focus on the model of run, hide, and fight. We're going to look at the planning component of how you're actually going to do it. We're going to look at the notable incidents that happened over the course of years. And then we're going to look at the interventions that you, as public, could do. With this being said, 
we're going to then employ this model, and it's going to actually increase your survival on how to deal with run out and fight and fight. Can you use the microphone or slow? Can't hear. Oh, can't hear? Good. Can you know now? I could continue from here. Yeah. Can you hear me now? We can hear. <laughs> so, with that being the last objective, that's going to be our goal for you to know how to survive from the threat of the lives in front of you. Has everybody gave their background of who they are, how long they've been a police officer, or any other profession? These two notable incidents played a role where I am right now. 2016, I was in downtown North at University Hospital when, in a class, at least 20 people stood up and they're like, I didn't know what was going on. That happened. That was the first incident management, medical, anything, all the response. When I noticed, I was like, this is nice. This is what I want, this is what I want to do. That incident lasted about 45 minutes. They triaged whatever needed to be done. They evaluated the scene and everybody was immobilized. That's how manpower plays a role in the bystander. That bystander's role. The follow up in 2018 was the Paramus bus accident on Route 80. I was in Paramus for another class and they activated an EOC, which is Emergency Operations Center, where kids and teachers were fatally doing the accident. So these two incidents for me play the role where I am right now and I'm going to live with this kind of Now, when we mentioned in the beginning you guys are going to be participating, would anybody know what's the earliest pre-recorded incident for an active threat or active shooting in school? You could yell it out. I'm going to say Columbine, okay, so 1999. All right. That's what you meant to say. Kent State. Kent State. What year is that? I don't know. Before my time. Don't be surprised. 1764. The early recording of an active threat in the school. Now, the reports vary, that's why I put it also it's all the media that we have, all the news that we have. The reports vary, but there was actually a memorial for the kids that actually were killed on that day. And it's not so far from us. I mean, they happen, like even the captain of the said, they happen almost every day. So, 1764, even before this country, Continue. Now we're going to dive into data. Data is crucial on this because it could vary from 1966, but FBI and the Homeland Security, they put it from 1970 all the way up. Uh, the pamphlet is being provided to you. That's going to be the one that pretty much is a sample. The data could be found online, and you can see how actually it's changing every single time. Every year, there's always an increase. Why do you think? The last few years has been on the rise. Anybody want to comment on that again? I quote, the Lord of advertising. Uh, the Lord of advertising. I call it the law of advertising. Once you start promoting something, it gives people ideas. So the more publicity and, and attention it gets, the more ideas people now have to do something. Okay. Think of the play role Think of the Everything is on the rise, right? So that's why we have such a spike at the last, pretty much last year that we have had this before. Mark, and, and there is a big difference, right, between active shooter and man shooter. Yes. Big difference. You got it. I'm not, I'm more serious on the right. <laughs> <laughs> so, based on years and how, and then victims, you have one, of course, that get killed, once they get wounded, and then the other ones that combine. Right, um, it's run, hide, and fight mode. Homeland Security, which the packet that's illustrated to on page two, actually provides graphs. You can see how much actually is pretty much 
detail in reporting on where it happens, how it happens, who could be, what kind of weapon we use. Like, uh, those are all the elements that's actually provided. You can you even have the website so you can actually look up in detail. And this is how the map looks that the Homeland Security put together all around the country over the last 50 years or so. So we're looking at less than 2,000 shootings, and it's, it's higher now because the data is also being changed. 600 fatalities, less than 2,000. And again, it's got to be changed. Now we're going to get into that component of our learning objective planning. Our planning part is what we're doing right now. Paris is crucial. So after you jump from here, what I mentioned earlier, you're going to go home and make sure you educate the family first. And it's going to be multiplied and multiplied. And that's, that's the crucial part for it. We can't predict them, but we can plan them. And that's what we're doing right now. These are notable incidences that happened. We could talk about them a little bit back Most of these were 2016, 2017, 2018. The data, recent, recent data, 2018, 2020 to 2022, is still being compiled. This is just a lot of stuff that's being put in. Like the chief said, mass shootings, mass killings. Yep. Any questions before I continue? No. So this is the data that you all have. The FBI did a 20-year uh, stump on uh, pamphlet of edition which shows where an answer is what's happening. And sadly enough, every year there's another. As you can see, 2020, 2021, 2022, it's going to make a difference. This is the part where everybody becomes a superhero. So, again, when I mentioned the incidents right in front of you, you will have to be telling a superhero to stop that threat. No one to know this is basically in Tennessee. Mr. Shaw was at a, at a restaurant. An active threat came in. I think he injured, he killed two people and one was injured. But as he went to the bathroom, that's all the time he needed to get prepped up, make the action. And for him making that action, he saved people from getting killed. And that's what we're going to with the other elements of how the body thinks. This is the part. The body always goes into tunnel vision. He'll get into it. It happens. That's how we are. Brain functions different ways, and you're going to have to react with fast. You cannot delay. That's the part of exception. So a bunch of neurons, everything is connected. So everything needs to be fast for you to do some action. Before we continue, So this first case study that I'm going to show you, I need you to count how many times white shirts pass the basketball to each other. That's what I want you to do. I want you to count how many times people in white shirts pass the basketball to each Yeah, but you were still counting. Did you see the 
see them walking back? Oh. Okay. Watch from here. Uh, oh! Uh, really? Yes, So you see, your mind was focused because I gave you an objective to follow. So you followed how many times to pass the best. What happened with that? Your mind was really involved in something else. They had to do it with the cat. And that's what happens when an event like that happens. You're going to focus on something that's narrow instead of wide. The other case study that we want to focus on. So same as the other one, he didn't notice that he was speaking to a totally different person, and it only took a second. Before I continue, as a councilman said, Columbine kind of paved the road to uh, our active, active shooter, active threat. It is still used wisely, to, widely today within the case studies because this determined the schools were not prepared for a threat. So I'm going to play an audio for uh, the, the teacher, Ms. Patty, who called when the incident was happening and she was talking to dispatch. I want you to think of how she's acting, how the dispatcher is, and what's actually going on, the totality of what's going on.
How do you think Miss Patty was, uh, she trained for this kind of event? No. No? What'd you say that? What about the dispatch? Uh, Those are the pretty much the after action reports. The components of these things, the active threat, they do after action reports like the FBI, local departments. These, these volumes are pages long. This encompasses everything mutual aid, reunification of the kids, injured, dead, you know, kids that are dead or even adults. It's a lot. So, those two pointers that you mentioned, that's what they were actually looking for for this. And that actually changed. They had books after that with dispatch with medical components and how to train them when you actually receive something. Dispatcher comes back and says, the needs to calm down. Listen to me. And when you give that somebody that order, like I gave you that objective and you were still counting, I was like, calm down. Did you see it? Oh, now I'm sorry. That's what it is. That's, that's what they need to do. The three cases operators have your bike line for that woman there. So the three cases operator has to keep her calm. But at the same time, she's got to get all the information she can from the responding units to come and assist. So you hit it right on the head. And you know what? I, I think our, our case operator are, are pretty good here. We go get better things. But you know what? That, that's, that's your main That's your main duty. To make sure you're calm. Make sure that gets to you what need. So that was, of course, that was one of the sad things. It's 50 kids that got killed. Things were 24 that were injured. But the incident started two students. But the incident didn't start last week. It started half a mile away from the school with explosives. So he distracted our first responders by going from the other side. And as they were dealing with that, that happened. And you could actually watch the video because we still have that where it's like it was almost like a roadblock ever because there was explosives all around the school. They they planned this. Because like any other incident, they always planned. Pre planning and then they act on it. <coughs> so, lessons learned. I don't want to repeat myself, but again, while the spending made changes, and of course, schools now are always governed by the federal standards that have top of security and resources available to them. Any questions? Yeah, I, I got a question. How do you determine that people are in the school and there's multiple calls to 911? You know, how do you determine that if an area of the school when, when you like say it's teachers? If multiple they, people call 911, yeah, yeah. how, how that determine the dispatch the locates the dispatch will receive that because the system has an NEL screen which right. determines the phone number and where you're calling call from. And, and sometimes we may not know the location of where it's coming from. That's why our guys go in and they're trained to go. God forbid they hear shots, they go to where the shots are coming from. However, our schools are, are not unique, but come up with standards. So when we first went into the building, we immediately assigned someone to overwatch, which means there's a guy in the security cubicle with cameras. That guy was fantastic. I forget his name. He was one. So we signed an officer with him, and now we have we have eyes throughout the whole school. So if someone jumps out of a, a room, we'll know where he is. Somebody, somebody hiding, we know where they are. 
So, like I said, we won't work together. But yeah, sometimes we won't run a location, so we would have to do a methodical check of that building. Because in this case, also, you know, the guys that responded, we had to be careful because they said there may be a threat of pipe bombs within the school, and which elevates the game even more because now instead of a dynamic entry, right, B, now you have to look at can't be out of place. Like if I go through that door, am I going to get blown up? So, you know, each situation is different. But if we don't have a location, it's a methodical room by room search. It doesn't matter how long it takes, but we'll shut everything down, lock down. Our main concern is getting the kids out, getting the personnel out. So what do you do? Safe search, and there's no harm to anyone else. You can elaborate on that guy. Well, if, you know, everything changed from Columbine. The whole standards changed. When they, what happened to Columbine, the failure in Columbine was the responding units secured the perimeter. Nobody went in. And they waited for SWAT teams. SWAT teams mm -hmm. aren't coming. They're coming, but they're not coming fast enough. So that's where the, the, the shooting response, the first, first officer on the scene, they're going in. They're going in by themselves. Unless, like, we're fortunate here that, you know, typically everybody's going to be coming at the same time, so you might have a second. But if I'm the first person on the team, I'm going in, and our job is to stop the violence. Nothing else. We're going to the threat of violence, the sound of the shots, and we're neutralizing whoever that is. The first guy in, unfortunately, they're going to go out, and everybody's going to follow in after that, and they're going to do the same thing. But Whoever the first <coughs> officer or first officer is going in, their job is to stop the violence. No matter what. No matter what. You have to go in. You know, and then there's stages of how this, and it's, it's just every day it gets stronger and better. The, the thing, there's, uh, and I don't want to get ahead, but we have the first response. Secondary response would be your tactical assets, SWAT teams and tactical teams, people that are heavily, you know, equipped with. Uh, body, the better body armor bunker and, and we don't want to get too many secrets away. Right. So <laughs> like, it's all yeah. The patrol guys are the first guys going in. And like I said before tonight they our patrol guys train the max. So and they they made me so proud what happened here. Because like I said, it's not gonna happen here. It's not gonna be like other other states where you go rain at something. No, we don't stage. No, we go in. Sorry. I took an oath on the guy. Serve like that. That means taking me out, save a kid, do it every day. Bye. So I just have a question. Is there a plan with the police department and the board of ed for an active shooter to be in the school? Um, just like you said, they plan. They plan this. And how about calling 911 takes time, okay, to respond. Any panic buttons in the yes. school? Yes, yes, she has. Yes, we are. This we has, are. Has the school plan. has their plan together. They know how to react. They know how we're going to react. We're going to go in it. But it's changing. Everything's always getting updated with technology and other things. So we're working on some things now. Because with every situation, like you said, thank God it did. Oh, thank you. Access cards. Sometimes we saw some, some things that went. But that's okay because. It was, it was a SWAT incident, so we take that. Every time something happens, we take it as a learning phase, uh, a chance to get better, to learn from our mistakes, if we fact that mistakes, or if there's a better way to do it, a more, you know, efficient and safer and quicker way to do it, we're always looking to change. We don't rest on our laurels at this point. Our thing is all about training, 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 and safety, safety, safety to our community. And if that means our guys got trained, on their own time, on comp time. Because God knows, you guys always bust my chops about overtime, so <laughs> you have to, to keep that down. So, so, so again, like if there's a fire, you pull a fire alarm in the school. Yeah. So if there's a shooter in the school, there's a panic button? There's, there's a yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. And also, we got to watch out <coughs> with the fire alarm. So if I'm distracted, if there's an active shooter, there, there's a lot of different things. We're trained for each and every one of them. Not just, the, not just the games, but and it's good to have Mike here because Mike's both. Mike's a SWAT guy, and he's in control. So, you've got the best of both worlds. Well, I, I, excuse me. I've worked in a school on 
I know where the panic buttons are. Yes. But there's a lot of people that don't know where the panic buttons are. They could be right there. That's the schools. That's the right. school. So you what's, your school the what's your training? What's your title? What's your, what's your job? Custodian. You're the key guy when we're actually going in? Yeah. You're, you're tagging, you're tagging. Right, right. You, you're right. And I forgot to mention, the custodians were like, it, this, that should be a measurable team as a boss at the school. It should be. Send your supply. We, we <laughs> how do we bust your chops all the time? The school. And we, we have a great work relationship. With our school, we have a great working relationship. So, like, we like criticism. How do you grow? By learning from your mistakes and by being criticized for maybe, you know, being able to do something better. So, uh, and, and I think we have a great school board. They're always working with us. They, they take our suggestions, right? They, and you know what? They, they care about the kids. Their, their main goal is the kids in that school. I'm sure East Orange is still. Yeah, it's just, it's just a very few people that know where the panic Everybody should be trained in that. I think everybody's. I don't know about the pad, but everybody should be trained. Are you trained in procedures and protocols? Okay. I am. Good. I everybody say should. that much, but it's easy. You saw it, yeah. So, yeah, boy. Does East Orange have the, uh, excuse me, sorry. East Orange, does, do they have an ALICE program? Uh, ALICE. So, ALICE is a nationwide program, it's for Board of Eds. It's alert, lockdown, form, encounter. We, we do know, we do all that. All of that. Yeah, but. So to, to answer your question, that's the component that the schools have in place. So instead of calling 911, that's where they go to. This is, this is the part that actually, what was your cherry? Paid for himself and, and gave it out. But of course, you bring it up for here. They, Oh my God! I think this job sometimes costs me more money than I make. Question. Um, so you talked about fire alarms. You talked about multi-agency response. I'm hearing about police response. How are you training with other departments and your agencies? Um, because the fire alarm may be pulled before there's ever a call to the police department. Yes, so with that component, we have a mutual aid agreement, and we're using MOAs. So around our township, which is West Orange, your Mount Clare, 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 King, because when they heard it was a school shooting, and she said, we're going in. Yeah. We are going in. Exactly, and, and they, they just showed up in force in mass and, and willing to help. And that's how we are in Orange, too, we help out. Like, uh, Pete is always the first one to go to other agencies. And what's your standing order? Go. Another town needs you, go. Take the guys and go. Because we get a lot of help from other agencies at times, and we're always willing to help, too, because you know what? Honestly, aren't we all one community? Aren't we all of the humankind? Police departments are for everybody. Whether it be North, North comes and helps us. We go help North. East Orange helps us. We help East Orange. So we all help each other. So there's no patch, you know? There's no patch. There's no, uh, you know, come from this town. We're, we're all the same. We all help each other. We all help each other. I think we the situation that happened at the was there a panic button at that time, and all, everybody came? There was a there was a 911 call. The, oh, the, was that panic button happening? That was actually uh, not an emergency call, and it was not an emergency call. So when, when that happened, that's when our dispatch right away went to our SRT over the radio, activated SRT, the supervisor that was here, he took a couple guys, and they were the first. That's why when the chief asked me in the beginning, I'm three minutes, he took the guys, and I, I was actually in that building. I'll always go in. I'll never leave my guys alone, ever. Just to reiterate on that response, I was out of the country at that time. Of course you was. And, <laughs> <laughs> it was right at, you know, obviously it was right after Easter spring break, we were out of the country. 
And the second that call went out, my phone was going off. And not only was I getting the calls and the messages uh, real time through here, but I was getting calls from the U.S. Marshals, the FBI, state police, the like every agency in this area that operates out of this metropolitan area were calling. And the, the real time information that was come out of our initial like call out was it was coming out, and I was just looking at my phone, and I'm like juggling, and I'm like, wow, these guys got this locked down that quick. Thanks, Boris. Um, so, you know, I'm in the Caribbean, and that's how fast it gets out. So the real-time information sharing that we have within our network throughout the, throughout the region, it's, it's apparent. So just know that you may see, like, you could live in Montclair, and I, you're going to see a barrage of law enforcement and first responders alike, because not only do they the law enforcement respond, fire and EMS, are the secondary that are coming as a rescue task force. So we have everything, it's just evolving and continuing to evolve the amount of, of infrastructure and assets that come with this. It, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And the training that goes on with this, and we're all trained alike. So if I'm trained, we're all trained just like any other law enforcement officer in the state. Like Pete Steve can go in with another team from anywhere in the state, and they know what to do. They so know what each other's doing when they go through the form an ad hoc team. It could be two guys from Orange, two guys from North, two guys from the two guys from the state police. We're going in, and we're going to we're gonna operate the same. Just like five officers from different towns, all different towns, they're going to marry up, and they're going in, and they're going to think and act the same way. Uh, like, Mike, you went in, you took the, uh, let me say, some government agency, right? Customs. 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 He was customs. So he was in with customs, Mike, was leading on their teams. And there, so. There was a situation one time, uh, I'd seen it on the news, was incident at the school. And police officers was there, quick, but they didn't. Yeah. That's not here. And you recorded that, the money that you bought? In Texas? Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was, that was, that, that was. Uh, honestly, I gotta be honest. You have to wait for a supervisor to get if you, more. If you don't know want, if, if you get to know me, I will speak off. That's I disgusting. Yeah. Disgusting. Are you kidding me? I'm surprised I'm one of those cops. We're like, I'm not a bank. That's an that's awful yeah. order. Don't go worry about the own kids. Go in. in. Kids. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Some of those guys. Nice yeah. Some of the civilians wanted to go in. Kind of clear. And save their kids. Yeah. Listen, I don't care who's. That's our kids. They're our kids. Right. It's not singular. They're ours. It's our duty to protect. And not, not speaking to that, because that was the strangest one. But the one thing I think the chief mentioned or somebody not in New Jersey, somebody said that's not happening. And the reason is because we studied from what happened around the country and we trained it. And the, the incident at the high school we keep talking about, years ago that might have been a logistics nightmare or anything like that. But I'll be honest, I was out there with Officer Joffrey when I got there and the group had already got in. I responded from home when I got the call. And when I got there, I, I teamed up with him. And as he said, FBI, state police, everybody was there. But it was, it was, there was no raised temperature outside. It was a hostile situation. It was a very a high moving situation. And the chief mentioned like the gadgets that the, the SWAT commander wants. But in reality, communication from the radios, uh, cell phones being utilized, communicated amongst ourselves. We had, we had combat medics from the Orange Police Department and responding medics there. We have our own canine now. We were able to handle it as a department and then transition with other departments and not give it the secrets away but everybody was ready to make their move when they were called upon. And that was that may not have been as, as smooth as years ago, but now other departments have learned it, we've learned it, and now it's become natural. So when the bell rings, we're ready to answer it in the way we want to do it without having to think and just go. And, and to this point, it looks like it's chaos, it controlled chaos, with people that are within it that know what they're doing. It may look like chaos to people around, but we're all fucked. Everybody knows what they're doing. So it's controlled. And, that's, you know, sometimes that these, these terrible, horrible tragedies, you know, at least we're learning to, and learning to protect our kids, our citizens, and our community, or just mitigating any more <laughs> damage or more death. Yeah, to answer your question, you got it, but like, so the everybody you touched on it, the chief said it also, actually, me and the chief are, I think, the first ones there. there right? So going through, Immediately, the first thing you want to get the kids out—that's safety. But also, if there's a threat, 
we're getting different locations of where the threat could be. So now you have Captain Mooney outside with Officer Dropping, and they're telling us wings of the school. But different wings of the school, the uh, maintenance, believe it or not, was like, I'm not sure because it was new. So thank God uh, the chief fought on his feet and said, hey, wait a minute, where's Mike? Get Mike. Mike knows the school in and out. Mike comes in. Uh, I think that's when you came with border. You came with border patrol. And I'm getting constant communication from the outside from Captain Mooney. Hey, we have this team going in that north police. They're on that side. Because obviously when you're coming in, you have to come in safely and efficiently also so you don't cross each other. So it's, it's like this, uh, Boris touched on it earlier about the brain and its chaos and what you see and able to to take in and decipher the right thing to do with the right moves. And that's all with training, uh, Lieutenant Castle said. Training, training, training. And, and, and two, with the cameras, they were giving us real time. So we knew where the other teams were going and where it yes. was So we know. Um, do you have a policy about using social media? Is it ever helpful? For the police or for? For the police. I mean, is it helpful? So that's that's a growing field with yeah. social media use. We're working on that with the city to to give information to the community on what's going on and what's happening, because at that time, you know, we don't want to put too much stress. So we may have a, a PIL come in, a public information officer, that's not a cop, but will be fed information to the command post, because at a time like that, we want to use all our resources. However, we can use the resources of the city get the information out there also to the community as what's needed. These kind of incidences, there's a lot involved. So we're talking about what bystanders, bystanders could use when an incident happens like this. What we're all talking now, now we're going in the active shooter incident management, ICS, incident command post, PIO. That's, that's an umbrella now. You're expanding on what's actually going on. So going on to yours and what Chief actually said with the PIO, you bring that along and then that information also has to be kind of filtered, sensitive, because you're not gonna put people's name on social media who's in, that's gonna be later on and that's gonna be from somebody from the city hall that's, that's gonna advise who's been blood and where they are. Yeah, we just wanna let you know at that point when that's happening that listen, stay away from that area. We have a situation going on, these streets are being closed. This is going on. So. Information later will follow, but we just want to get the layer of spheres as it's, it's, it's contained the area. It's, it's not spreading out. We have everything under control. Sometimes just a little maybe blurb like that to make the community feel a little better. But I, I think we're on off track with active shooter. Yeah, yeah, we want to teach you guys how to protect yourself. Now let's move on. All right, so remember that uh, component, how the brain thinks and what's going on. And we're going to revisit with Patty or how we answered. So, the phases of the reaction. This is the slide. You think Patty was in denial? She was in the hospital? No, I don't think she was in denial. Uh, I'm saying it was on. She was in denial. She, she couldn't believe it that it was happening. That's why she was all over there. Our main goal, in this whole phase, is to get them to That's when you're actually doing something and you're active on it. You don't want to, you don't want to deny what's going on. Like some, let's say, for example, right now, shoot, we heard shots fired. I'm just going to blow the up. We're popping up. There's a muffler. What happens if it happens again? That happened by the end. Are you still in denial? Now you're actually, as a member, as a group, you're going to deliver it like this. Hey, gotcha. That's the same with fire practice. Yeah. And you can't deter it. So when an incident like that happens, you need to get to here as fast as you can. That's why every time we go out, you have to watch what's going on. You can't just walk right, walk down. Because that's going to be the tough when you have to act. And of course, what I just said, take that action. Make sure you get to that last phase as soon as you can. So the response gap, we were talking about, we're coming on subject with the active shooter. 
nationwide, it varies. We're here, we're very rich. We're very compact, we're so we on top of each other. When you go out Midwest and California, we're kind of like spread across. And you can see that on, on the map, right? In the country, the states get a little smaller hand and they get bigger and bigger. So their response time is of course gonna be a lot higher than ours. And then they, they don't have enough resources to begin with. Sometimes they have to travel 50 miles just to get to where they gotta go, compared to us. It's right down the block. Another case study, going to the objectives. This happened in 2007. This one also played a pivotal role in the after action reports in some schools. The individual killed over 30 students, injured 25. The school was pretty much lit up for all the all the gun fire away. But one key thing that he did is he chain linked every single door. Why do you think he did that? Response time on us. He trapped us because we were not able to get in. So when he locked dead, he had the whole school to himself. And that's why they learned. And now that component goes from an active shooter instead of run hide and fight. Now it's an active shooter. Now you're establishing the casual collection point. I don't want to go off subject, but that's another element. It just keeps on adding up. There's so much involved. There's a video on it. There's a survivor. She actually created it. She created, uh, created like a fund, a foundation that improves school equipment and training for the individuals because of this incident. I think she was in the library when it happened. And again, that denial phase, she was like, I can't make my child. Well, unfortunately, it was. So the model, what we're going into, as we mentioned earlier, and as Cap mentioned earlier, it's not linear. It's not going to happen where you have to follow that run, by uh, but it's going to, you're going to have to hide. If there's something going on right now, you can close the doors, lock, and we're hiding, right? But if it gives an option that we can escape, we're going to run. And that's what we, i got to change the slide on that. I'm going to look at more case studies. Anyone need water? Does anybody need two minutes or we're, we're, we're just go through? So this is a case study that was in, uh, in Paris. Individual with a white school, excuse me, uh, went to a coffee shop and just started and just started uh, doing his work. about this can you see it huh no this lady right here the same point she's getting all her bags somebody's shooting outside she's getting all her bags she's in the denial phase i gotta get all my things i gotta get out of here with all my stuff because i just bought it right but somebody should shoot it that's the part that this program we're trying to tell you is that whatever Unless it's not your family member, your stuff. 
trying to take it, leave the place. You need to get up and run, not your stuff. This one could be graphic. I don't know if they're going to show the whole thing. This is in uh, Panama, where uh, there's a board, of, a board of ed, I guess, a meeting. The individual came in. His wife was fired, and he was angry. And then we'll get to the video. Spontaneous heroism. When the plane didn't land, the plane landed on the
and stuck in his nose. I won't go any further. You could actually find this on, on the good old internet, so you could look into it. He, but he missed every single shot, and it was, which is great. But he wanted to go out because I guess he was angry. But that's your active threat. It happens at a meeting, just like that. And then the way he acted, and, and the, one of the councilwomen acted, she didn't care. She wanted to take a gun, but unfortunately she did it. So, that's, so getting back to Ryan Hyde's fight, what could anybody do in that situation? You couldn't run. You couldn't hide. He was negotiating. You saw that? You said, why? Why? Now you're taking your time because security guards, you always kind of want to have a security guard right So you never can work at that. So because he was taking that deliberate time to like, why do you have to go? You know, it's not the right thing. He was almost buying time in this matter. And then when it happened, <coughs> Actually, he did discharge in a very short moment of time. That's when the security guard he went in, he took that to action. He went, he didn't deny, he didn't deliberate anything. He was like, no, shots are being fired, or no action. Right. And that's what he did. He determined that the this needed to happen. Did he die? Oh, yeah, he, he died. That's right. He was a terrible shot. <laughs> Some, some, listen, sometimes luck happens, and it doesn't, it, it's, you know, some people just in that, with the, with the, in that reaction of what they're doing, they're not trained. This guy's just firing, like, if you saw how he was doing it, but if you see some of the other videos that come around, it's not the same, and, you know, you have to use that, but... When you, like you said, when you're in a situation like that where you can't run, you can't hide. If you can't negotiate, like what she did was hit them. Right. I mean, at that point is when she did that, everybody should have bowled that guy. Right. And, and, and you know, get control, like get control. Uh, you'll see the video later. Um, what, what to do? But you should always have a plan. Like it's crazy that we have to think like this. A lot of a lot of people in this room. I don't want to date and age people. But back in the day, we would have to do air raid drills. Our kids now in school are doing not only a fire drill, but they're doing these type of drills to, to learn how to do these things. And you have to, and they're teaching our children this. So you have to always have a plan of action, no matter what you do and where you are. You're walking into a movie theater. You're looking at every sign to see how you're getting in, how you how are you getting out. It, it, it's just that's this that's where we are. Not just. You know, the, there's a lot of mental illness in this world, and this, you know, in the country. So you have to think. You don't know who you're standing next to. You don't know who you're sitting next to. And we were just talking earlier. You know, some people may just that be that middle of the road, and some people may be high strong one way, and high strong the other way. And you know, the, the middle of the road, I may just walk, walk through it. And they may not think that. You know, they may, you, we don't know like how planned they are. But you always have to know. I mean, they happen to move theaters. They happen to chop them. They happen in all these schools, uh, supermarkets, churches. churches. I mean, I mean that's the most sacred place you could ever be. Hospitals. I mean, I kept. I was keeping a list, you know, and then breaking them up. I can't keep up with the list of people, but just they, they just keep the file and man, and man, it happens everywhere. Yeah. So I mean, I got shot at the old building. These days, it's more important than midnight. It's <laughs> shot through the window. I hit, on, I hit under the desk. We have to just always know every time you look, you know, everywhere we go, it's a familiar area. It's like, we've been around like West Orange. You've got to walk in. Where's the closest way to get out of here? You know, if, if you're running down that aisle, grab, grab up the, 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 the hornet spray. Man. I mean, if that's what you got to use to, 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 to neutralize your. Your adversary, then, then so be it. A fire extinguisher, spray a fire extinguisher. Is that spray and that powder? You're gonna, you're gonna disorient, and you can now have that avenue of escape. Always try to get away, and, and like I said, when it's safe, 
get it out. Try to get description, description, description. And we'll always get that. That's get relief. So we know what we were looking for. I mean, that's other thing. You see what happened up in Buffalo? No. I mean, there's just so many stories that we could talk about. And it's just knowing how to get in and get out. No matter where you are, just always know your surroundings. That, that old saying, see something, say something. Drop, drop a dime, call that, just go around the way. We'll come, we'll come out. Yeah, it's kind of strong. So as we continue. We have had a close window. Shot for shot, other places. Yeah. Um, you might want to, like, you know, and have to make yourself familiar. You know, use the bathroom, um, walk in the back, you know, find your way out, you know, from the back, you know, in case of the bathroom, you can easily, you know, you know, maneuver, you know, and negotiate and walk in the water. You have shot by big box stores, paint parks, walls, you know, use the bathroom, and you just like walk in the back. Sometimes just to see what's going on, just so you can have a point of reference to say the same thing that you can have, you know, ways to move around. And your head, like you said, always, always have to be on the screen. Just the one thing, I mean, just walk, just sit at a traffic light or just sit at a, at a bus stop somewhere. Everybody's listening. Yeah. 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 You know, nobody's paying attention to what's going on. So everybody's there. They're playing the video games, and, and the younger age, ten, our tender age, are, are now doing that. So always got to know what's going on. Now sometimes these kids FaceTime and they're doing that could be our best friend at times. But it, it, everybody's so focused on their technology now, nobody's really watching what's going on now. Digital are people like myself and a lot of people in this room, we always have our heads on the street. Well, for the most part. You know, a lot of people don't walk down the street. We always say, oh, that's a big company. Somebody could run up on you, snatch the phone out. I mean, just as simple as that, just an opportunity. And that's they prey on opportunity and time. I mean, the opportunity. Yes, I got a question. Yeah, um, have we been coming? You public works. Have we ever, like, uh, worked with public works or municipal city hall, emergency employees training also, emergency action shooting? Have we ever did that at all? No. That's something that could be requested through office in the chain of command. Okay. Are you wanting to be more than that? Presented. Uh, more than that. How are you thinking about that? Well, okay. Because again, this is this is a, a municipal meeting. That's what it's right. Down to the public. But this guy should be introduced to everybody. As the council, council, and council work. They're the ones who want this for the public. So, and we're here to provide it. So in this case, this model was basically just a number of steps that you could take. Is, is there a security officer or police you know? We have, we, have, we, have, we, have security, we have security officers at the school. Um, right? We have security at the school. Right. Yes. Yeah. How about City Hall? Yeah. City Hall, uh, I think uh, two units in there, correct? City Hall, security guard, no. Edith. Yeah. The lake? Yeah. Park City Park said, we actually have things. It's a spot one great thing now that we have, as you mentioned earlier, is definitely the doors are always going to have to be locked. The cameras. And you always have somebody in the foyer with the only hands that it makes you physically see the individual or whoever is actually coming. Anybody can just walk into anywhere. It's a public building. Anywhere. Yeah, I know. Public structure. We have the same issue here. <coughs> We're attempting to set that up okay. as we speak. Yeah. We're willing to show anybody. This, we like this. Yes, ma'am. I want to take this opportunity to thank our councilmen, Montague and Moss, and our Orange Police Department for this opportunity. 
Uh, historically, in Orange, we had what we call the PCC. That was the Police Community Coalition. And historically, we would meet here every other month. And it would be an opportunity for us to communicate with our policemen and them to communicate with us. And I'd like to reiterate with uh, what you said earlier in terms of we must all work together, right. and that is true. And we're all in the same boat, all Orange Township. And we really want to hopefully get back to that routine because it was just wonderful. It gave all of us, we, looked, we had it on our calendars, we knew what the date was going to be, what the time was going to be. And every other month, we would come together and have an opportunity to do as we have done this evening. And I just want to thank all of you and everybody who has come. And hopefully the next time we'll get a chance to reach out to additional people uh, so that we're, we're packed. And I think that would be wonderful. The last time we had a meeting similar, we met at the church on Wall Street. And uh, we used their parking lot because at that time, because of COVID, we could not come together as we have uh, tonight. But we really, we had the fire department involved as well as the police department, and everybody was on target, relevant to coming together and working together. And it's been a long time. I know COVID had a lot to do with it, but we're back on track. And I hope this will be just the beginning for us to be able to be together and communicate and just keep it going. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we should take ladders in our own hands because we were waiting on. Don't wait. <laughs> So we're going to set up uh, a date for September. Maybe we still have that side. Maybe we in our back bar, come and walk bars, have some tanks and refreshments. We'll have something there. So me and the captain will give a date. Okay. And it's going to be our date. So it's going to be set in stone. And we're going to have in September. And we just have to get communication out. What we'll do is we'll set up a date. Make our contacts. We can have. We'll, 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 we'll disseminate it through our our council. Yeah. Council. And, and I'm sure you remember the last time we met in this here on the other side. The other side, yes. but it was packed. It was, packed. it was all to all. Yeah, yeah it's September. Yeah, hopefully this is a nice day. We can be outside. You know, it's a nice environment. Not too crowded. Not too packed. Maybe Michael bring his uh, you know, barbecue out, cookout. Seriously, it's, it's kind of better and better by the moment. <laughs> but isn't it supposed to be that way? Oh, it's supposed absolutely. to be family, it's supposed to be community. Absolutely, and that's what it's and about. What better to buy than know the food? I'm with you all the way. There you go. <laughs> and we're going to hold you to it, too. I don't lie. <laughs> my word is my word. That's okay. it. Okay. Very good. Am I right, everybody? Right. Absolutely. My word, my word. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, thank you. Looking forward to it. And thanks, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Because we're about to be both of the So the as as we continue with the pod model, I don't really have to elaborate too much. The only thing we definitely say, you have a pick a room and you notice where you are. The way we train, it's either a corner bedroom or center bedroom. You want to stay. I don't need every other day to be naked You want a more, you want a, uh, the closest corner so they are not visible. And then once you sell, once you're actually able to barricade, so if the door can't close, you want to throw something at the door so it's in the way. There's also tools available. One big thing during the training that they did provide is um, fire, fire department uh, retired uh, poles. If you cut them in certain uh, certain lengths, if the doors have those um, those scissor thing poles. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You can slide that hose right through it and the door cannot open because that hose is, is so well put together when you, when you lap it over it, the door is, it's almost like it's locked. The dramatic door closed, that's what it is the first. On the top of the door, that closed, it goes, the door, it's like a fire hose over it. 
can no longer expand. Right. You also have those uh, about the fire department on the retired fire boats very easily outfit a full district. You also have those hinges that go at the door. That could also be one way. If the door opens up towards you, you can pry it in so as they push in, they won't be able to make this as well. Those are some things that predominantly put that eye. And then we'll actually watch the video that the councilman actually provided. It's actually very well put together. The last one is fight, that's your last majority. And as we mentioned, it doesn't have to be last, it can be for us, it can be for the So as we recap, in reality, when we do this type of training, we would actually make you guys do it. So in reality, you could go home and do it with your family. But if, in this case, that we didn't happen, we would say, all right, there's, there's shots fired, what are we gonna do right now? We're gonna come out here where the shots are happening, we're just gonna barricade and put everything in the door. And Pace. The last one is, of course, the uh, law enforcement arrival. The lieutenant and the captain did mention they do vary, and of course, the, the recent ones will be Texas. They had a delay of 77 minutes, which they definitely put a Columbine all over again into, into the same. But with that being said, when we conclude this and we're going back to it, you also introduce those elements that we were going back and forth. The ICS, the active shooter, management, the reunification, that's all other elements after this. Right. Thank you for coming. Stay safe. <laughs> Good job, Paul. Council of the Bidwell, would you like this? Hey, Paul. Yeah. Can you show my video? Oh, yeah, I'm just going to make it. Oh, this, this is a real good picture. Hey, go ahead. Hang on, I'll take a moment to call for a minute. Survive 
Two things from this video, uh, I just want to go, that are very important. When you do, if you do run, make sure your hands are up. Because you know that sometimes the attackers like to disguise themselves as victims and leave. Always have your hands up. And the second, the best place to fight, is you see that door, see the doorway? That doorway, and we call it a fatal fun in our training. Even for a cop, that's the most dangerous place you could step in, because now, like frame down. And that's where, you know, you can take a hit. So that goes for a bag. I took the bad guys coming in. Stay on both sides of the door, if you can, depending on the way it swings. Grab something, hit his arms, take him down, get that gun away from him, jump him. Like Pete said, the fire extinguisher. Don't just I want to hit him with that fire extinguisher first. I like to squirt him in the face and then hit him. But use methods like that to make sure you will survive. Not the mommy's here, so we're gonna have to start all over. Okay. Oh, <laughs> you got my tape. <laughs> yes. Oh, Cal we have <laughs> Councilwoman Eason. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Hopefully, this is very, very important. You can bring it home to your families, to your schools. Um, so I just want everyone to be safe, be aware of your surroundings, the situations. So you won't be a victim. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Hello, Councilman Roman Issa. Everyone, have a nice evening. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say also thank you, everyone, for coming out. I hope you guys are more prepared for a shooter attack incident. Um, I just want to say that thank you to Chief Video yes. and his team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, and one thing. I feel, and I hope you guys feel safe with our Arts Police Department. I do. You know, with all that training, all the technology that they have, they keep us safe. So feel, feel safe with them because I know they'll keep us safe. Thank so, um, Anybody have any questions, any issues? Please speak up right now. Thank you guys for coming out. Appreciate you. Thank you.